Welcome to the Brilliantly Resilient Podcast. What's your train wreck? Everyone has one. The question is, are you going to live there or are you just visiting? Let's check in with Mary Fran and Kristen to learn how to come through not broken, but brilliant. Hey everyone, before we dive into this week's episode, we have a resource that we wanted to tell you about. Transform every week of yours with our brilliance bit that will deliver right to your email inbox. Sign up for it at brilliantlyresilient.net and keep living brilliantly resilient. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. We are back with a woman that I cannot wait to dive into what she does. Her name is April Irvin. April is a managing partner, and this is the best title in the world, the Chief Peace Officer of Sustainable Leadership, LLC, a workplace well-being consulting firm dedicated to helping organizations sustain effective leadership and create healthy cultures. There's so many words in what what April talks about that are resonating with Kristen and I. She is committed to addressing the epidemic of burnout that plagues far too many executive women in leadership, which is an issue that has greatly magnified with the pandemic. So April, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So I, as I mentioned to you before we started, when I saw your title of chief peace officer, I thought I have got to have a conversation with this woman. <laughs> so I, I feel like that's a word that, you know, we use, unfortunately, in, in relationship to major conflicts and war and whatnot. But I feel like that could be a word that we should really embrace more for our own lives. So tell me where you came up with all of that. Well, it's interesting because very early in my career, in my life, I was the opposite of chief peace (laughs) officer. You could have called me chief chaos officer (laughs) because life was very hectic. Life was very chaotic. um, Life was very busy. And so in my journey over these last, what, 15 years or so, I have learned to embrace inner peace and recognizing that peace does not mean that there's not struggle, challenges, or difficulties in our lives. It means being in the midst of that and still having calmness in our heart. So I share that a lot with my clients and who I speak to. And it's recognizing that that peace is priceless. And it's something we want to work to embrace each and every day of our lives. And so that's where that came from for me. And then I also, as I always share, God gave me that title. I didn't make that up. (laughs) Like he gave me that years ago because he knew that I needed so much more peace in my own life because life was not peaceful. Life was very chaotic. So it um, has shifted significantly, thankfully, Um, as you all talk about being brilliantly resilient. um, I definitely feel that I am walking in continual resiliency but it's shifting from that place of living a very stressful, chaotic life that was very imbalanced that resulted in significant health challenges for me very early in my life um, to coming to a place of peace. I always share this story. I tell, I'm a storyteller, so I'll take you back mm-hmm. to 2005. I sat in my doctor's office at Northwestern University Hospital in Chicago, and I had my doctor say to me words I thought I would never hear. After weeks and weeks of testing and undiagnosed issues and blood work and MRIs, my doctor said, April, I truly believe your work is having a detrimental impact on your health. So she said, you have two choices. You can either find something else to do or manage significant health issues for the rest of your life. Mm. I was 35. Oh, my God. I was 35 years old. And my doctor was saying to me, if you don't change now, you may not be here. You may not be here. And so the blessing is I changed. It took a long time, but it was a lot of shifting and that recognition that how I was living my life. I'm blessed to speak to a group of women this weekend about Superwoman is time to retire your cape. I love that. I saw that, that you had mentioned that. And that's, that's something that I I just gave a a speaking, uh, had a speaking gig not too long ago and said the same thing. I, I said, look over your shoulder. Do you have your cape on? It's yes. time to put it back in the closet. Gotta you know, and that's something that we all do. Yeah. So, but that's where my struggles and chaos came from. That's why I did not have a great deal of peace in my life because I was trying to be, and as I share in my speaking and with my clients, still 
have the challenge. I said, I'm going to shred the cape, but the cape keeps coming back. And I'm like, <laughs> how can I get rid of this cape forever? Because it still tries to come back. But it's just recognizing that we have to embrace that inner peace and kind of focus on really releasing the chaos that oftentimes is in our lives. So let me ask you this, April, in terms of releasing and taking the cape off and having inner peace, thinking about all of our listeners that are in in a similar boat to me, you know, a, a single mom managing three kids and and all of the things, you know, it it there's there's days where I end up shoved in the closet to grab the super cape when I didn't <laughs> intend I was going to put on my workout clothes and not <laughs> the superwoman cape today. <laughs> right? Or stay in the pajamas yes. and I put the cape in the, how, what are some, some initial steps? I mean, mine, mine's been a six year journey to get to this part of, I will say, I told you I was in Orlando this weekend to stand yes. in the Orlando airport, knowing that I may not make it to the plane because their system is so horrific there and have peace with the fact that I may miss this plane and have to go to plan B and C that has never happened to me in my life. It took me six years to get to this point. Can you maybe give us some tips to shrink that journey? <laughs> that it doesn't take bit? six years or 15 <laughs> years as it did for me. What you just shared, Kristen, is such a clear example about this. You see my hands mm -hmm. letting go of control. Mm. So I have been one like this. The majority of my career, adult life, I've got to control everything. I'm, I must control the planes and the airport. I must dictate <laughs> how everything goes. Mm -hmm. This. So I actually have a picture of myself like this in my bedroom. With your hands open and like I, that? Yes. And I'll see it when I wake up in the morning to remind myself I can't control everything. And I don't have to control everything. And eventually come to the point where I've got to let some things go. And so that's one way when I think about embracing that inner peace for me, recovering type A personality, anybody else type A? Oh. Here? <laughs> recovering type A personality, realizing, wow, I can't control everything. I can't control the world. But Kristen, I empathize with you because also the reality, we have life. You have mm -hmm. children that you are taking care of. You are a career woman. You're speaking. You're doing all these wonderful things. What I recognize, but we have to prioritize ourselves first. And I know that's easier said than done. I say it all the time, put yourself first, but you have to prioritize yourself first in order to give from that place of overflow. Because I don't know about you all, you ladies, but I've given from the place of depletion. Mm -hmm. And so when your cup is empty, you can't give in the way that you need to give. And so it's really that prioritization and doing the things that you need to do on a daily basis first before you're able to give to others. And the other thing I will share is being willing to ask for help and being willing to receive help. That's a significant one. And then women that I speak to, many of us talk about how it's hard to receive help. I don't know if you all struggle with that, but I've struggled with that. I care for my mom who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And this summer I had a gap in my caregiving and I was trying to do it. On, talk about put the cape back on. I was trying to do it all myself. I was exhausted. I was exhausted. But now I have a team. I call them earth angels. I have a team of four <laughs> that are helping me. But also I had to say, this is not your expertise, April. That is your mother. Let's be a daughter instead of a caregiver and being willing to ask for help. And then the other thing too, I've just learned so many resources are out there that can benefit us but really being able to welcome individuals into my home, which is different, um, allowing people to do things differently than what I would do them. Because just because you, I just did it a few minutes Wait, ago. Wait, the there's another way besides mine? Yes, yes. <laughs> we're not the only ones, but she's making some salmon. And I was like, oh no, I just did it. Too much <laughs> rosemary. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> really? So again, as I share, when I speak and when I teach and when I'm with clients, I am with you in this journey. It's a process, but there are specific things that I believe that we have to do for ourselves to mind our mental, emotional, and physical health in order for us to live at the optimal level that I believe we're called to live and also to be able to help and serve others in that way. But you're right, Kristen, it took you six years, but you got there. You weren't at the airport trying to direct the plane. <laughs> nope, <laughs> like I wasn't at the airport directing the planes. And, and I, I will say this to April, I never would, for people that are listening that think I cannot let go 
of certain things and I got to hang on tight to certain things. I never would have dreamed that I would be the person standing in that airport. Not, I didn't have panic attacks. I wasn't sweating about it. I just was like, I'm going to see how fast or slow I'm going to get through the security. And when I finally get through, I did look up and see if the, when the next flight was that I could take. So I at least had the plan B, you know, mm -hmm. and then I thought, let me just see, and I'll do all the things I can do to make it go a little bit faster. Let me get my shoes off now. And let me do this. But I never would have thought I would get to this point where I, even with my wackadoodle ex-husband, I had court the mm -hmm. other day and I just sat there breathing, not saying much. That threw him for a loop. I just didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, I'm like, nothing's going to be productive. So I'm just not going to say, I never would have thought six years ago that I would get to this place, but it got to a point, like you said, with your health, that I was at a point where my doctor said to me, I mean, the hair was falling out. I was a, and they were like, you have to make changes. And my kids and I actually got even closer in the midst of the storm by me communicating to them. I can't do this for you today because I have to do this. Or we, I know each of my kids styles. Now I paid attention to that and communicate on the front end. My nice daughter, Ooh, sometimes I wonder how we're related because she is such a calendar person and needs advance notice. And I come whirling in with a great story at the last minute of why I just arrived, but we had to really start respecting each other's ways and, and managing all of that. And the peace just came from having that communication. That's it. That's it. That's how we welcome greater peace into our lives and something you shared you know, even with your daughter, acknowledging and honoring how other people function, that they don't function the way we do. And that's okay, because yeah. that's letting go of that control as well and setting boundaries. I mean, that's been a significant, that word, if I hear it one more time, that's been a significant issue for me over my lifetime, but I'm learning to set healthier boundaries. And then also to honor other people's boundaries when they set them for themselves. Because what I've found is that when we don't have healthy boundaries, that's where everything kind of bleeds over. That's where it's like, okay, you know, not really clear who's responsible for what. And then also just accepting the fact that we can't change anyone but ourselves. Yeah. I've spent a long time trying to change adults. <laughs> and it's like, you can't change adults. You can only change. You're the only adult that's going to change. And so it's just recognizing that too. So it's all of those things, but I just really celebrate you, Kristen, for that because it's a journey. And that's what I talk about all the time. I talk about burnout, you know, but I also talk about resiliency and just recognizing through the journey that we go through, we learn, we experience, we make mistakes, we fall back down, we get back up, we put the cape on, we take the cape off. It's a process. And I think that we really have to, especially as women, we have to give ourselves so much more grace, so yeah. much more grace. I got that guidance from one of my male clients. He said, that's a leadership strategy he's never used, but he had to during the pandemic, grace. Grace, empathy, flexibility, and patience. But for us, we've got to give ourselves more grace. We're doing a lot. We're doing yeah. a lot. We're responsible for a great deal. We're mothers, we're caregivers, we're professionals, we're authors, we're speakers, we're, you know, confidants, if everybody calls you to solve your problem, you know, if you're a coach, everybody calls you to solve oh, their yeah. life problems. It's oh like, yeah. You're not my client. You're I not know. my client. <laughs> I'm not, you're not paying me. You know, um, I, but... I gotta tell you, I want to land on this for a second here, April, this yeah. grace thing. Cause I yeah. didn't understand this for a while that everybody was talking about. And I've started, I've started, I've spent the summer really diving into that. And when I tell you now with my head around it and what it is and, and putting it in play, Another thing that has given me so much peace, you know, just the other day when I, in Orlando, when I was like, here I am, I, I got there 35 minutes later than I wanted to, because I relied on a shuttle. I relied on two Ubers that canceled. There was a lot of things that happened. And I, the old me, even two months ago would have stood there beating myself up. Well, you should have, and you could have, and I actually stood there as there's 10,000 people in line. And I said to myself, well, Kristen, you did the best you could. You are, are working this whole thing. Your son and you had the best day yesterday. You did great work on Saturday. There was a lot of things happening that, that you didn't remember to walk in there at nine o'clock in the morning and say, do I have to schedule your shuttle? <laughs> right. <laughs> I went through all of the things as if I was talking to my best friend. As yeah. if I was talking to my son, Michael, and mm -hmm. said what I would have said to them. Oh, my God, I'm going to cry. 
And I, for the first time ever, I thought you did the best you could. And now all of those things fell apart and you, here's your plan B and, and, and you're, you're making it work. And I ended up making the plane at the last minute, but that moment of giving myself that grace yes. was so freeing that I never had the panic attacks or freaking out at anybody in the line. That's it. That's it. You gave yourself grace and you gave yourself freedom yeah. because what's the worst thing that could have happened? You missed the plane. Well, there's other planes, but it's a shift in our mindset. And I've gone through that, Kristen, as well for myself. Like, okay, April, what's the worst thing? Is it life and death? No, it's not. So let's just step back for a minute. Let's just breathe and say, okay, not ideal, yeah. but you gave yourself grace. And I think that's where, I know that's where I've struggled personally, um, is giving myself more grace and saying, I'm doing the best that can I can at this time. And yeah being okay with that and celebrate. So I celebrate you in that. And that's what we have to do when we talk about how do we keep peace? It's a daily practice. It's a daily practice. It's the little things, you know, even driving, driving down the street. I'm like, okay, this person's going extremely slow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'd like to drive slow now. I'd like to drive my grandmother's speed of driving, but just saying, where are we rushing to? Where are we trying to get to? And for years, I remember I wrote a blog years ago. I said, we rush in our cars. We rush down the streets. We rush to work. We rush through work. We rush through lunch. We run. Where are we going? Yeah. Where are we going? And so it's thinking about how do we do those small things? Like you said, you just breathe through it. It's like, okay, if 10,000 people up there, what are we going to do about 10,000 people? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you know, there's nothing we can do about that. But it's just saying, you know what? I'm going to take the pressure off. I'm going to take the pressure off. And I always talk about sometimes I feel like we wear the weight of the world on our shoulders. And uh, I got a massage. I was in, I had a speaking engagement in Scottsdale. Oh, my God, that was amazing. And um, I got a massage the last day before I left and she touched my shoulder. She said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, again, I teach all of this, but she said, oh, your shoulders <laughs> too much too much weight. And so I actually just came off a week sabbatical. I took a sabbatical and decided to close down everything. Um, I got the caregivers in place. I am in seminary right now. We were on a break. I didn't read a thing. I had that one. I had a speaking engagement. Thank God it was in Arizona, but I did nothing. Mm. I did nothing because I needed to. And I talk about that a lot too. When you're working to embrace peace in your life, Sometimes people say sabbaticals, that's six months. Well, everybody can't do a six month sabbatical. Everybody can't do a month sabbatical. I was able to do a week. You can do a one day sabbatical and just saying, okay, I'm shutting every, I, all my emails. I said I was on sabbatical. I have three different emails. I'm on sabbatical. I'm not available to October 17th. And my rule was if anything I was asked to do would take more than a half an hour, I would not do it mm. oh. during that week. And I actually took myself to a hotel here locally because I didn't leave town until Wednesday. And I just rested and took care of myself. And so that's something I encourage as well. It's just the recognition that in that self-care process, there's a lot of discussion right now about self-care and well-being. We have to take that so very seriously. And so I count it as, and I know you all talk about kind of going through your storms to mm -hmm. emerge, you know, into that resiliency. I'm blessed to have had that storm at 35, I'm 51 now, you know, and so it was a blessing in disguise. Now going through it, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it was not easy to go through, but now I'm like, okay, April, you have almost lost your health. What else really matters? You can speak around the world, but if you're not healthy, what difference does it make? You can write a zillion books, but if you're not healthy and in your right mind, what difference does it make? If you do all the successful things, but you're not loving on your family and appreciate and treasuring them now, what mm -hmm. difference does it make? And so that is, but that's a part of the process. But I always say it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So that's six years for you. <laughs> that was just a beautiful marathon. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to say I ran my first marathon. It took Yay, me six years yes. and look yep. at me at the finish line. <laughs> but you know years. what, April, I will say for our people listening, you can even take a, a sabbatical from every Wednesday. I have no meeting Wednesdays. I do not schedule Excellent. a meeting because I have so many other people that I am working with. Wednesdays, it is all, and that freed up my creativity. It gave me space to do stuff for my family. And Excellent. I get more done in a week 
by not having meetings on Wednesday. So take a sabbatical. Yeah. I will say, look at your schedule and what is the thing that is triggering you into this, you know, spiraling towards burnout and yeah. where can you control? You can control your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and be I, okay to say no. There was Go something ahead. that someone said when I was looking at um, your website, I think this was on, and it was a, a woman, one of your clients said that you helped her not lose herself to the mission. And, and I think that the idea behind that is that all of us want to do good. We want to do good work. We want to help. We want to serve. But you you can get lost in goodness, if that makes any sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. You can really get sense. lost in goodness. Yes. Yeah, you can. You can. And when you, like you said, when you have a heart to serve, when you have a heart to give, you know, there's something innate, especially in women, about being caregivers and givers and, and wanting to do, but you can get lost in that. And so what I talk about for myself and I also talk about for my clients, you have to uproot the roots of why we function the way we do. And so mm -hmm. I talk about uprooting the roots of burnout. And so what I recognize my root of burnout was approval addiction, mm -hmm. seeking approval, wanting to be validated. And that's rooted back to grade school when I got good grades. Yeah. I was a good person. I was celebrated. And so my new thing is no more chasing A's. No more chasing A's. No more chasing approval. No more chasing uh, accolades. No more chasing good grades, you know, even at this age. But just recognizing that we want to do good work, but we don't need to validate our self-worth by the work that we do. Hmm. There's a difference. You yeah. want to do good work and serve and help people, but that doesn't make you worse and that doesn't make you better. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times, at least that has been my journey. I struggled with low self-worth for so long. And so, but when I achieved something, I felt good about myself. When I helped someone, I felt good about myself. Well, no, we need to feel good about ourselves because of who we are, not what we do. And so I it's just that. realizing that. And so many of my clients, some of my clients that have been in the nonprofit world, you know, in that world, there's a justification. We're doing good. And so we can work ourselves and exhaust ourselves and not sleep and not eat because we're transforming the lives of children. Or if you're laying on the ground, it doesn't matter. You can't transform the lives of children, but it's being okay with serving purpose, but not losing self. Mm. Mm, and so that like was that. a struggle for me, serving purpose, but not losing self, even in the work that I do now. I love what I'm blessed to do, but I have to know I'm worthy, whether nobody else calls me to do an interview, write a book, speak to anybody. And that's a continuous process as well. It's something I'm still growing and healing in to say I'm worthy because I'm enough. I'm enough. And whether the mission gets served or not, I'm still enough. And so I feel like that's where that's rooted for, for a, a lot of women, at least I know that's been my journey. I would have to imagine that when you started thinking about it that way, I am enough, I am worthy. And when you're coming from a place of abundance that you have all of that already and not a place of lack where you're chasing it, I'd have to imagine if we looked at your journey, that that was a tipping point for you of, of all kinds of great things happening. Oh my gosh. And it's fresh. I mean, I would just say this year it has been absolutely extraordinary. I'm like, but that was a shift in me. You're exactly right. Yeah. That was a shift in me. And then also recognize that we're not called to serve everybody. We're not called right. to serve everybody. And so when I speak about burnout, everybody, it's a global epidemic. It costs, it's what the data says, $190 billion globally in healthcare costs right now. Mm -hmm. It's a global epidemic. But I know I'm not, I speak to different audiences, men, women, all types of organizations, but we're not called to serve everyone. There's a specific woman that I'm called to serve that is going to resonate with me. Or there's a specific person in education, because I was in education for a long time, that can read my first book and know, oh my God, you're speaking exactly to me because you walked in my shoes. Mm -hmm. But it, you're very right. It's that coming to that piece to say, you know what? I want to do this work. I want to help transform the world. But there are plenty of other people out there <laughs> that are talking about burnout and well-being. And let's do it together because everybody, you know, needs this. But it's saying, wow, no, I'm enough. So I will be transparent. It's fresh for me. It's a continuous process because it's easy to go back into those behaviors and those proclivities. 
And it all, you know, what I always say, everything's rooted in childhood. I don't care what anybody says. Everything's rooted in childhood. Yeah, it's what's familiar. So however I function as a little person, I'm like, oh, little April's coming out. What's going on? <laughs> Let's work through some things, little Literally. April, because little April's being <laughs> triggered April. right now. But it's like, it's okay, little April. We're fine. Adult we'll put April little April little, in timeout. And then yeah, like little April, just rest, <laughs> get some peace, be chief peace <laughs> officer for a little while. But it's just also that recognition, as we just talked about earlier, is just giving ourselves grace to grow and develop in the ways that we are and know that this is a continuous evolution. I am a very different person today than I was last year. And so it's a continuous process. I used to think, was well, this journey over yet? And I'm like, no, because your eyes are not closed and you're not in heaven. So no, the journey's not over yet. It's just continual growth, continual. If you're willing to do the work and if you say yes to yes, I want to grow, I want to develop. I, and most people genuinely want to. Sometimes we just don't know how. Mm. We don't know how. We know we want to change, but how do we want to change? So Agreed. how does this work if you are in a leadership role in an office, you are in mixed company, and by that I mean men and women, because I don't know that men address this the same way that we do as women. And then you have women who, as you said, you know, they want to be the achievers. How do you step back from that and you know, it's take care of yourself? It's, it's the recognition, although we function in very different ways. What is that old book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus? Yeah. <laughs> and right. I know neurologically our brains are, you know, supposedly different. The group that I spoke to in Scottsdale two weeks ago, men and women. And yes, the women in the room were much more expressive. But when the men spoke, I heard the same thing. And after my speaking engagement, my a gentleman was at his hotel room across from mine. He said, thank you so much. Thank you. I needed to hear that. And so it is also as a leader, and this was a leader of a, a global uh, chief peace officer, chief, chief people officer, and she created an environment for her team to feel comfortable with being vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And that is the critical piece, because if it does not come from the leadership, transformation cannot happen. That is why my business is called sustainable leadership. If the leadership does not believe in focusing on well-being individually and organizationally, it can't happen. So men and women express it in different ways. So even in that group that I spoke to, the women were a bit more expressive, but there were a couple of men that were very expressive. Once I had the opportunity, I just listened to what they were saying and they got vulnerable. You know, one was sharing, he was struggling, he's traveling the world and he's got young kids. That's Mm -hmm. a reality for him as well, even though if his wife is the primary caregiver, but he wants to be there for his children. And so what I talked to him about, that's okay. And it's also okay to say no to some things so you can be there for your children because they're only going to be children for a little while. Then they become big people. I was with my girlfriend. I'm like, who is our son? I don't know who this child is. Like he's six, three. He was a little boy. Like, where did he come from? But it's just that recognition. But it is a different way in which we express ourselves. But as a leader, you have the opportunity. I always talk about creating a counterculture, a counterculture. I don't know what culture someone may be in and their global corporation. Create your own culture. What type of culture do you want to create? Because that's what leads to resiliency. And that is what leads to retention, to create an environment. And we're such a place right now where if we as leaders don't embrace the fact that people have been through some very difficult things, you're never Mm. gonna have a healthy organization. And you're also not going to sustain the people. There was one leader there and she said, she had a leader come to her and resign because the leader said, I'm burned out. I cannot, and she said, this was one of my best team members. Yeah. So it's the recognition. Yeah. And part of it is, is perhaps perhaps women taking the lead in initiating these conversations yes, and, and kind of allowing, you know, our male counterparts to, to feel and recognize that this is normal, especially after what's happened in the last several years, yes. the rules, the rules are just not the same. And, and this, I think may be an opportunity for you and your mission and, and like-minded people 
to to say, okay, we had the whole world closed down. Now let's rebuild based on this sustainable idea. And that's the other thing that I that I love that you talk about is keeping this going, but recognizing that it's a process. It is. It is a process and recognizing that it is creating the space and the environment. And what if we have not been taught in the last few years that we cannot run at a thousand miles an hour and just be okay with that? I don't know what. I mean, when the whole world shut down, we saw, wow, you can actually be pretty productive, functioning very differently. One of my clients said, her daughter said, I'm so happy you're not getting on a plane every Monday. (laughs) So was she. So yeah. as things were opening back up, she said, I'm not getting on a plane. I don't, I'm not, I, I like spending this time here at home, but it's just as leaders creating the space. And I know everyone's dynamic is very different. You know, I, again, this team I spoke to, they were a global HR team. So yes, they are traveling all the time, all around the world. But again, you have to still set those boundaries for yourself. You have to create an environment when for yourself and those that you lead feel comfortable being vulnerable. Leadership vulnerability is real, and that is actually transformative, and that's actually how you sustain organizations. And, you know, as we've talked about giving yourself grace, but it's many times people um, feel uncomfortable expressing themselves in different work environments, and that's what has to shift, that we have to create these cultures, as we were talking about earlier, Kristen, even with your uh, daughter, different communication styles. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's different styles. I took a conflict uh, resolution style assessment. Whoa, okay. We all manage conflict in different ways as well, but honoring each other, honoring where we are and knowing that, yes, we want to be successful. We want to achieve. We want to achieve our mission. We want to do well for our corporations. We want to do well in our businesses. And at what cost? What cost? So we want to do well. But what are we willing to sacrifice? And my recommendations always, you can still do that without sacrificing at all. You can still do that without sacrificing self to the point of depletion. Love and it. and that is the, I guess that's the key to, to be enough, be self-aware enough to, and maybe does that require like scheduling maybe regular check-ins with yourself? Like, where am I right now? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It really does. I recommend it to one of my male clients. He makes me smile because he said I transformed his whole life. I'm like, no, I didn't. (laughs) You transformed your life. Your executive assistant transformed your life. I said, you just need to put white space on your calendar. White space. Yes. Nothing. I like that. Put white space on your calendar. Daily. And he said, April, my assistant did that. And I, but he first thing he said was, I didn't know what to do. There's nothing to do. (laughs) There's nothing (laughs) Just be still. Just pause. Just- it's amazing what you can see in the new perspective you bring to things when you have that time to pause and do nothing. Yeah, it's powerful. It's pa- I talk about, that's my, the burnout factor prevention strategy. The first thing you do is stop. Just stop, stop. That's what I did with my sabbatical. I had to stop, stop doing, stop being, stop emailing, stop scheduling, stop. And then rest reflect, recalibrate, Mm -hmm. take time to rest. The nap strategy is real. Kids have a a monopoly on naps. Naps are for adults too. Take a 20 minute nap because if you're exhausted, you can't think neurologically, you can't think clearly. Reflect, take some time for reflection and then recalibrate. And that's where I come up with some of my greatest ideas. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm clear now. I'm not exhausted trying to do everything and figure everything out. And sometimes you just have to stop. You just have mm-hmm. to stop. And a white space doesn't mean to be filled up. All the kids it's like it's just white space. I think you, well, put you know you there. put the little colors in your calendar. Like, don't get excited when you have too many colors. It's yeah. not a good thing. You should have colors in your salad, not on your calendar. Yes, yes just yes, yes. Sometimes yes, you yes. just have to stop, and unfortunately, now we stop. have to stop. We have to stop. <laughs> April, stop this before is before you get stopped. Like oh, I, I like I that. Stop, stop before, before you get stopped. Stop. I've been writing. I don't know if you've seen me looking down. I'm scribbling furiously. That's a good one to end on. Stop before you get stopped. So yes. this has been such a refreshing, quite literally, conversation for us. 
Tell right. everybody where we can find you and get some more wisdom from April Irvin. Definitely. So uh, my website is aprilirvin.com, April, E-R-V-I-N.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn uh, as well under April Irvin. And I will share, I'm excited. I just launched an online executive coaching program called Seven Weeks to Greater Peace. Um, so awesome. you can find that on my website. There's a tab that says Greater Peace, but just an opportunity to have dedicated self-care Sunday time to really focus on embracing greater peace in your life. Good Thank stuff. you so much to April Irvin, our chief peace officer. I am going to keep that phrase in my mind as I move forward through all of the, all of the life stuff that comes at you. And I urge everybody yes. else to do the same. Krista, I'm going to turn it over to you. You know, I'm thinking um, we usually wrap up the episode by reminding folks to go to our website and and sign up to receive the the brilliance bit that we send out every week. And honestly, this time I'm like, you guys sign up for this thing because it it's one of it'll give you one minute of these this whole stop reset recalibrate and and I will say you know most people uh, would say you should schedule these in advance, Kristen. Don't be typing it every week. I love to each week type this thing in. So I have to read it and remind myself of, of a one little bit of brilliance for living brilliantly resilient. So thank mm -hmm. you, April, for giving us about 57 bits of brilliance today <laughs> for living brilliantly resilient, but everybody go to the website, sign up for that. So you get that each week to do that stop and reset and recalibrate. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the brilliantly resilient podcast. Join our Facebook group and follow us on YouTube to be inspired with tools to reset, rise, and reveal your brilliance.